chapter 9, if you will, please, in your Bibles. And uh, before we get into the passage and the message tonight, I'd like to thank your pastor for inviting me uh, for the invitation. It's a privilege and an honor to be here. I have so many memories of Fairhaven Baptist Church and the college. And as uh, uh, your pastor just mentioned, I was youth pastor during the 80s there at uh, Faith Baptist Church in Bourbon, Illinois, and several, he named some of them, um, uh, Clinton and his brother Jeff was here for, for a while. Of course, you know Clinton, Mexico, and, and Maud uh, uh, Liga, uh, her name was Landry, and of course Gina Schrock, and uh, uh, Nathan and Danny Starr, and uh, they were here, and uh, uh, the Smith girls, Jan and Julie, and there's that, that's to name a few, but uh, not all of them graduated, but several did, and Many are serving the Lord, and so this place is a, a special place uh, for me. And as uh, your pastor mentioned, uh, Fairhaven Baptist Church was one of our supporting churches for all the years that we were a missionary there in Argentina. The church took us on in 1988. Uh, when we were on deputation, raising support to go to Argentina, and this church was always very faithful. And uh, in prayers and giving, and when we'd come home on furlough, we'd usually stop by and, and uh, you know, speak to the college or the church, and it's meant a lot to us. I want to introduce my wife. Uh, I'm going to have my wife Judy stand, and this is my wife Judy, and uh, we will be celebrating our 37th uh, wedding anniversary this December, and uh, what a wonderful lady to put up with me now for 37 years, and so, uh, but uh, God has given me a wonderful wife, and we have three children. All three are serving the Lord. My oldest is assistant pastor in the Atlanta, Georgia area. My other son is uh, a layman. Uh, teaching a young couple Sunday school class at Faith Baptist in Bourbon A, the same church at, that was our home church over the years. And then my daughter is my secretary at Grace Baptist Church in Lockport, and my son-in-law, my youth pastor. Uh, so God has blessed our family. All three of my kids grew up in Argentina. My daughter was born there, and uh, so I thank God for that. And uh, the Lord has uh, given us, graciously giving, uh, given us over 34 years of full-time ministry uh, since 1982. And uh, as your pastor mentioned, uh, when I came off the field in 2003, Lord led us back. We, we trained national leadership that took the church over. We had a Bible institute there and a camp ministry, youth conference. And uh, we trained nationals, and they took the work over. God called us back to the States. We started two churches from scratch in the Chicago area, uh, Spanish. Uh, one was uh, totally Spanish. The other was bilingual. And, uh, and then in 2013, uh, God uh, led me to take my first established church, the only church I, I hadn't started uh, that I that I had pastored, and uh, so Lord led us to the Grace Baptist Church in Lockport, Illinois, and God has been blessing tremendously there. And to pray for us next week, we're going to have our annual missions conference, and so we're excited about that. So if you will pray for us, if you have your Bibles open, look in Acts chapter nine, and we'll look at verses one through six. We'll read. Let's all stand as we read the Word of God in uh, respect and honor to God's Word. Let's read Acts chapter 9, and I'll read the verses. You follow along as I read. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city. It shall be told thee what thou must do. I want to preach to you for a few minutes on the subject, Paul's two life-changing questions. 
Paul's two life-changing questions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's been a joy to be here. Thank you for the music, the orchestra, the ladies' ensemble, uh, the, uh, the video, Lord. We saw the missionary and... And, uh, and Lord, thank you for this church and what it has meant over the years, the stand it has taken. Uh, thank you for the college. Thank you, Lord, for the good people of Fairhaven Baptist Church. And uh, Lord, we will uh, eternally be grateful to this church all the years they supported us. And, and Lord, I, I pray you'll bless now as the word of God is open, Lord, to speak to us, challenge us. Uh, I pray that you'll convict us. And, uh, Lord, we will give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much. The Apostle Paul, without a doubt, is one of my favorite heroes in all the Bible. He was a great man of God, a tremendous missionary, the apostle to the Gentiles, a preacher of the gospel, and an example of God's transforming power. Uh, and, you know, you look at the story here, just in Acts chapter 9, you see uh, when Paul was an unsaved Pharisee and how he hated the Lord and how he persecuted the church and, and, and Christians. And uh, uh, it's amazing how God transformed this man uh, and, uh, and saved him. And the message tonight is this, uh, how did Paul, uh, get to this point of, of transformation. How did Paul become all these wonderful things that I just mentioned? Uh, a tremendous missionary, uh, the apostle to the Gentiles, uh, uh, a preacher of the gospel, the writer of at least 12 epistles, uh, maybe 13 if you, if you believe he wrote the book of Hebrews. But how did he become all these things? Well, I believe that we have to look at two questions that Paul asked in this particular passage that show us how Paul became all these things. First of all, I want you to look at verse 5, and we see question number 1. This is the first life-changing question that Paul made to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, you know he's on the road to Damascus, and he's going there to persecute Christians. And on that road, a light shines from heaven, and uh, he falls to the ground, blind and and the Bible says that that he heard the voice of the Lord Jesus and uh, the Lord of course uh, uh, called uh, him uh, there on, on that road to Damascus and once you look at verse 5 with me we see the first question and he said who art thou Lord who art thou Lord now this is the first question of the two that Paul asks and Paul was, of course, an unsaved man at this moment. He's unconverted. Therefore, I believe it was the most important question that he could possibly ask at this time. Who art thou, who art thou Lord? Uh, I believe that this question right here is the most important question that any unsaved person can possibly ask. Uh, notice how the Lord answered this question there in verse 5. He says, I am Jesus. Good answer, amen. Paul says, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord responds, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. This question could be paraphrased, who are you? Uh, are you Lord? Or even... Who is Jesus? You see, who is Jesus Christ is the most important question that a sinner can possibly ask. It is a question of faith. And the most important answer that a man's ear can ever hear is, I am Jesus. Amen. And then to hear about who Jesus really is. And I want to say tonight uh, that Jesus was not just a man. He was not just a teacher. He was not just a prophet. He was not just a leader. He was not just an historical person that was condemned to death and crucified. He is 
the Alpha and Omega. He is the Amen, the Angel of the Lord, the Anointed One. He's the beginning and the end, the bread of life. He's the cornerstone, counselor, deliverer. He's the door. He's eternal. He's the emancipator of our sins. He's the fairest of 10,000. He's the first and the last. He's our fortress. He's our foundation. He's our friend. He's the, uh, he is God. He is the good shepherd. He is healer. He is the high priest. He is holy. He is the I am. He is judge. He is justifier. He's the king of kings. He's life. He's the light of the world. He's the lily of the valley. He's the lamb of God. He's Lord. He's Messiah. He's mighty God. He's the morning star. He's the Nazarene. He's new life. He's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He's the open door. He's the prince of peace. He's prophet. He's the quickener. He's our redeemer. He's the resurrection. He's the rock of ages. He's our savior. He's the servant. He's the son of God. He's the son of man. He's the second Adam. He's the testator. He's the truth. He's the unifier. He's the vine. He's the way. He's the word of life. He is the word. He's wonderful. He is the yoke that is easy. That's who Jesus Christ is. And when Paul on that road to Damascus and that light shone down and he fell to the ground and he heard that voice, he looked up and said, Who art thou, Lord? In other words, he was asking, are you Jesus? I believe that, that Paul had heard about Jesus. We know that he had. He was there when Stephen preached the, uh, the gospel in Acts chapter 7. He was there and, and he saw Stephen stoned to death. He heard about Jesus. For some reason, he hated Jesus. For some reason, he persecuted uh, Jesus. But on that road to Damascus, he asked the most important question that any sinner could ever ask. Who art thou, Lord? Who are you, Jesus? And, uh, and I believe that Paul got the answer that day. Amen. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And I believe that Paul received Christ as his Savior. The bottom line is, what will you do with Jesus? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever been confronted with the question? Now, if you're, if you're here tonight, and I'm not going to take for granted that, a, a, that in a Wednesday night crowd uh, that there are not uh, unsaved people. There could be someone here tonight that does not know Jesus as Savior. And if you do not, then you need to, you need to ask the question. You need to be confronted with the question of salvation. And that is, who is Jesus? And I remember as a 10-year-old boy, uh, I remember I, I got that settled, that question settled. I got the, the, the question settled in my heart, who is Jesus Christ? And, uh, and when I realized who he was and what he had done for me, and he died for me, and he was buried, and he rose again from the dead, and when I realized what Jesus could do for me and that he was the Savior of the world, I opened my heart and accepted him as my personal Savior. I'm a product of the bus ministry. How many bus workers we have? Raise your hand. How many bus workers? All over the building. God bless you, bus workers. I'm a product of the bus ministry. I was not uh, uh, raised in a, in a saved home, a Christian home. And uh, I, was, uh, I was saved as a result of a bus captain coming by and knocking on my door as a boy and, and inviting me to ride a church bus and, and uh, come to Sunday school. And, and uh, I'll never forget how, how uh, the bus captain came. And I wasn't interested in church at that time, to be honest with you. I wasn't interested in the Bible or God. And I remember he came and his first, uh, uh, the first thing he began to say was, hey, we, you know, we sing songs about Jesus at church. We learn Bible stories, and I'll be honest with you, none of that really, uh, you know, really got me. And, uh, and then he said, but, and you know what? Tomorrow we're going to have a special day. We're going to have all-you-can-eat ice cream. And I said, what time does the bus come? Amen. And, uh, and listen, I went to church for the ice cream. 
I'm tell you something, I got more than ice cream when I went to church. I heard for the first time in my life a clear presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I didn't get saved that first Sunday, but I continued riding the bus. And uh, during vacation Bible school uh, in June of 1969, I got saved. And uh, the question, who is Jesus, was settled in my heart. And I accepted him as my personal Savior. So the first life-changing question that the Apostle Paul asked here in this passage is, who art thou, Lord? A question of salvation, a question of faith. And thank God Paul got it settled. Thank God he got saved. Now I want you to look at the second question tonight. We find this in verse 6, the second life-changing question. It says, and he trembling and astonished said, here's the question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now this is the most important question that a Christian can ask. Now, I believe that Paul became a born-again Christian between verse 5 and verse 6. This next question that Paul asked is a question of obedience. Paul got the question of who right in verse 5. And in verse 6, he gets the question of what should he do. And he got that right. And, you know, I believe when a person receives Christ as their Savior, that there should be a desire in their heart to do what the Lord wants them to do. After Paul got saved, what's his first question? The first question is this, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? By the way, you should never stop asking that question. Every day you get up, you ought to ask, Lord, what do you want me to do today? Lord, lead me today. Guide me today. Holy Spirit, fill me today. Lead me. And uh, that question, that, that's the most important question you can ever ask. Lord, what do you want me to do? And, and do God's will. Uh, when we are willing to do God's will, he will always show us what we should do. And that's, that's why we have the Word of God. It says in verse 6, And the Lord said unto him, now, in this story, Paul actually heard the Lord's voice. He heard an audible voice. Uh, but you and I, we get our instructions from the Word of God. Amen? Uh, this is how God tells us what to do right here. We've got, the, we've got a sure revelation. We have a complete revelation from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, this is how God tells us what we need to do. This is our instruction book. And, uh, and, and I believe that when a Christian sincerely asks that question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? God is going to show you. He's going to show you from his word. He's going to use preachers and teachers and, and, and Christians to, to, to help in, in showing you what the word of God has to say. And I want to show you some results of being willing to listen to God and to do his will. Paul, after he got saved, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He was willing to do whatever God wanted him to do. I want you to see a few things here. Uh, when, results of when a Christian is willing to listen to God and do his will. First of all, he'll walk with God. Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says, And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called straight. Now, let me stop right there for a moment. Now, Paul uh, has gotten saved. Actually, his name was Saul at the time, but you know his name was changed later to Paul. And uh, we see that after he gets saved and after, after he asks the Lord what uh, he should do, then God sent him into the city, goes into the city. And uh, there was a man named Ananias. Many believe he was the pastor of the church there in Damascus. Uh, we're not exactly sure about that, but he was a man of God. And uh, the Lord uh, uh, told uh, Ananias, I'm want you to go find this uh, guy named Saul. And uh, it says in verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight. And in, isn't, it, isn't it interesting? This is another sermon, by the way, right here. It's interesting that Paul is now living on Straight Street. That's the address. 
He says, Ananias, I want you to go to the street called Straight. You know, before he got saved, Paul was crooked, amen? And now he's living on Straight Street. Yeah, but that's another message, amen. Uh, but uh, Ananias goes and he finds Paul. Look at this. And he says that he's going to inquire the house of Judas. That's where he was staying. For one called Saul of Tarsus. Look at this now. For behold, he prayeth. What's he doing? He's praying. I mean, he just got saved. And then he asks, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And what is he doing? He's praying. He's on his knees praying. I believe that when a Christian is willing to do what God wants them to do, they are going to walk with God. You're going to spend time in the Bible and spend time in prayer. And, and uh, I don't understand a person that calls themselves a child of God that doesn't want to uh, walk with God and spend time with him on a daily basis. Let me ask you tonight. How's your walk with God? How's your walk with God? Uh, how's your, your time on a daily basis in God's Word and in prayer, walking with God? Right away we see Saul is praying. And I believe that this is a result of the Christian that says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And then the second thing, second result is this. Look at verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight, and look at this, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. The second result of the Christian that says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do and is willing to do it is he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit, controlled, led, uh, guided by the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, we see that uh, Saul uh, was uh, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit uh, here in verse 17. The third result when a Christian is willing uh, to listen to God and do his will is in verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was what? Baptized. Now when we think of baptism, we think of obedience. Talk about how it is a step of obedience. It's an act of obedience. I believe that when a Christian is willing to listen to God and to do his will like Saul was, I believe that he will be an obedient Christian. That doesn't mean we always obey. You and I know that. We have the flesh. We struggle. We battle. We don't always do God's will. We don't always obey. But you know what? We ought to, we ought to live a life of obedience. We ought to live a life that desires to serve God. He was baptized didn't uh, waste time getting baptized, uh, being obedient to the Lord. I don't understand people that get saved and, and uh, trust Christ, but they don't want to follow him in baptism. I don't understand that. And, uh, but uh, Saul didn't waste time doing that. Another result of being willing to listen to God and do his will is found in verse 19. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened then was Saul certain days with the disciples, certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. I believe there was a local church in Damascus. There were disciples in Damascus. There were Christians in Damascus. And I believe that when a Christian is willing to do what God wants him or her to do, they will assemble with other believers. We're talking about being faithful to the local church. We're talking about being saved, baptized, and a member of a local church, a Bible-believing, fundamental local church. And uh, Saul wasted no time assembling with the believers. I've heard a lot of Christians over the years in my 34 plus years in the ministry, they'll, they'll, they'll make a profession of faith, get saved, maybe, maybe even get baptized. And they'll say, you know what, uh, you know, they, 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 they'll get out of church and they'll say, you know what, I really don't need church, you know, I, I can worship God in my home and, you know, this and that. And, and uh, I don't understand a Christian that doesn't want to be in church. I don't understand a person that claims to be a born-again child of God that doesn't want to be with other Christians, amen? 
I, when I got saved, even, even as a 10-year-old, I knew I needed to be in church. I mean, every Sunday I needed to be in church. Uh, when the doors were open and no one had to convince me, no one had to come say, you need to be in church, son. Man, I knew I needed to be in church. I wanted to be in church. And I still want to be in church. Amen. And uh, it, it just keeps getting better. And uh, so we see the result. Another result of being willing to listen to God and do His will is in verse 20. And straightway... He preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. The word straightway in our King James means immediately, right away. I mean, he didn't waste time getting out there and witnessing and winning souls and preaching the gospel. I believe that when a person is willing to listen to God and is willing to do what God wants them to do, they will be a witness. You know, after I got saved as a 10-year-old boy, I got off the bus, and I went right into the house, and I said to my unsaved mother, I said, Mom, I said, guess what? Guess what happened to me today? And she's thinking, I got in trouble, you know. And uh, what'd you do at church? And I said, no, I didn't get in trouble. Uh, Mom, guess what? I got saved today. I told her how I got saved and accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. And, and, uh, and then I went across the street to my best friend. His name was Kenny. My, my friend, I said, Kenny, guess what happened to me today? I got saved. I accepted Jesus. I thought it was natural. I thought it's what I'm supposed to do. Tell people about Jesus. I don't understand Christians that stay silent. I don't understand Christians that, that won't be a witness and tell other people about Jesus and go soul winning. To me, it was the most natural thing in the world. I'm not saying it's not against the flesh, and, and many times it is, and, but I'll tell you what, uh, a person willing to do God's will is a witness for Christ. And then look at verse 21, another result. But all that heard him were amazed. And said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? I mean, they're, they're, they're all these, these other people there in Damascus are saying, Wait a minute now. Hey, isn't that that same guy that was persecuting Christians all over Jerusalem and Judea? And, uh, and this guy's, uh, I mean, look at this. Now he's preaching. He's saved. He's born again. Uh, they were amazed by this. Another result of being, uh, of being willing to listen to God and do his will is a changed life. And the kind of life that's so changed and transformed that people can't help but to notice. They were amazed at the transformation that happened in Saul's life. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature. And that's the transformation that happens when someone gets saved. Happened to Saul. What a transformation. Then I'm going to give you one more. Verse 22. The last result of being willing to listen to God and do his will. In verse 22. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which, were, which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Now, I know you could apply this to the physical strength that he, he received and got back, but I also believe this refers to spiritual strength. And I believe that when a person is willing to listen to God and do his will, there will be spiritual growth. I've been saved now for a little over 47 years, and I'm still growing in the Lord. I'm still a work in progress. I'm far from arriving. I, I, when I get to heaven, I'll be perfect. But I'll tell you, I'm still growing in the Lord. I'm still learning the Bible. I'm still walking with him and getting as close to him as I can. I still have a long way to go. And it's exciting to grow in the Lord. It's exciting to get closer and closer to him and try to be more and more like him. And, and uh, uh, Saul, we see spiritual growth in his life. Two questions that changed Paul's life. Two life-changing questions. And the first one was a question of salvation. Who art thou, Lord? Are you the Lord Jesus? 
The one I've been hearing about? Are you Jesus? And I love the Lord's answer. I am Jesus. The one you, you're persecuting. And when Paul got a hold of who Jesus was, when Paul got Jesus in his heart and accepted him and received him as his personal Savior, he got saved. Life-changing question. Who art thou, Lord? And then after he got saved, the question that is most important for any born-again child of God, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And Paul did it. Amen. What God told him to do, he did. Wasn't perfect man. He was made of flesh and blood. But I tell you what, he did God's will. And tonight, what about that first question for you? You got that settled? Huh? Got the question of salvation settled? You got the, the question, who is Jesus? You got that down? Have you been saved? Have you been born again? Have you trusted him as your personal Savior? He's the only Savior. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And then if you're saved tonight, and I trust that most of you, if not all of you are, how about that question? Have you got that settled yet? God's will? <laughs> A question of obedience, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And then do it, amen. He's going to show you. He's going to show you. He's going to show you through his word. He's going to show you through the Holy Spirit of God. He's going to lead you and guide you every day if you just be willing. Paul's two life-changing questions. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to ask the instrumentalists if they would please come to the piano and organ, please. Heads bowed and eyes closed. And just a minute, we'll hear the music. And when the music plays, if the Lord spoke to your heart. How about that first question now? How about that? Uh, you got the question of salvation settled? Has it been answered for you? Jesus is Savior. He is, he is a Savior of the world. He's my Savior. And then accept him as your personal Savior. You got that down? And then the second question for you, child of God, what wilt thou have me to do? Are you doing what God wants you to do? Are you willing to do what God wants you to do? Heavenly Father, I pray you'll bless the invitation. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. As we...